There is a lot of misinformation out there around this coronavirus pandemic, and the subject of vaccines is perhaps more rife than most. In this film, I'm going to drill down into the science to address some of that misinformation and answer, hopefully, all of these questions, along with the help of Danny Altman, Professor of Immunology at Imperial College London. So stick around and let's go through it. Let's start at the beginning. A vaccine is a type of medicine that trains the body's immune system to fight a kind of disease that it's not come into contact with before. Vaccines are typically administered by injection, by nasal spray or by mouth. In order for a vaccine to work, certain molecules from the pathogen, that's the disease, must be introduced to the body in order to trigger an immune response. These molecules are called antigens, and they are present on all viruses and bacteria. Once the immune system has become familiar with these antigens, it can pounce on them quickly and stop the real infection in its tracks. Consider it a training game ahead of a big match, where you can only learn the rules by playing. Don't have the vaccine? Well, you're going to be 10 nil down before the game has even started. You may or may not recover to win, but either way, you're going to be sick for a while. The first vaccine developed was for smallpox, and that was by Edward Jenner back in 1796. He discovered that milkmaids who'd previously caught cowpox didn't then go on to contract smallpox. Why? Because the cowpox virus was similar enough to the smallpox virus that it could train the immune system to play that game and win before the game had ever really got started. Why do we need a vaccine for COVID-19? Can't we just let the virus run through the population and achieve herd immunity, which is the state that we've all got to get to in the end anyway? Well, there are a few things I want to say on that subject. And the first is that if you try and do that, you are going to kill a lot of people that do not need to die. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. Some quick sums here. Um, if you put the numbers on the conservative side, with 9% of the US having come into contact with the virus already, and only 60% needed for herd immunity, um, with the confirmed numbers only of uh, deaths already of 200,000, excess deaths obviously significantly higher. But even if you take those conservative figures, you're still looking at 1.1 million more people who need to die in the US alone. Run off the figures in this article and take the 80% upper margin, and you're looking at 6.5 million people. You'll also lose 10% of your population to the life-changing condition that we're currently calling long COVID, with the consequential impact on productivity, GDP, and on the health service. And SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. That means natural immunity doesn't last that long. It's going to go round and round in the population year after year, just like the common cold until it mutates down to something more tolerable, or potentially mutates in the other direction and gets even worse. And then we really do have a problem. What if we run out of body bags? So yes, we do need a vaccine. But as we're going to see later, one size does not fit all. What are the different types? Broadly speaking, there are four types currently in production, and they are live attenuated, inactivated, subunit conjugate, and toxoid vaccines. I won't go into too much depth, but this is basically how they work. Live attenuated vaccines can be made in several ways, but all of them involve attenuating the live virus so that it struggles to replicate well in human cells. However, it's still very good at training the immune system, so your body recognises the virus and knows how to fight it off before the virus has exploded throughout your body, uh, like SARS-CoV-2 does after the wrong bat sneezes in your face. The advantages of this type of vaccine are that it's superb at stimulating the immune system and that you can achieve lifelong immunity with just one or two doses. Disadvantages are that because it's a live virus, it's not great for people with weakened immune systems and it needs refrigeration, so it's expensive and difficult to transport. Examples of live attenuated vaccines are the ones for measles, mumps and the flu nasal spray. 
inactivated vaccines kill the pathogen using heat or chemicals. Although technically with viruses, they're never really alive, so you don't really kill it. But either way, uh, the inactivated vaccine keeps that pathogen intact so the body can still recognize it. Advantages include the fact that an inactivated vaccine is unable to revert to a more virulent form capable of causing disease, and it's easy to store and transport. Disadvantages of the inactivated vaccine are that immunity is often shorter lived and you need boosters. Examples of this type of vaccine include rabies and the flu shot. Both subunit or conjugate vaccines only contain pieces of the pathogen they protect against, like its sugars, protein or casing. Subunit vaccines contain only part of that pathogen to target an immune response, whereas conjugate vaccines use a combination of elements. Advantages include a very strong immune response and almost universal use, including those with weakened immune systems. Disadvantages are that you often need booster shots. Examples of subunit and conjugate vaccines include those for hep B and shingles. Toxoid vaccines contain a toxin or chemical made by the bacteria or virus. They make you immune to the harmful effects of the infection rather than the infection itself. Examples of this type of vaccine include the ones for diphtheria and tetanus. So these are the traditional classes of vaccines, but some of the contenders to take on COVID exist in a completely new class, and they include DNA and RNA vaccines and recombinant vector vaccines. DNA and RNA vaccines work by introducing part of the relevant genetic sequence, which is coded for a disease-specific antigen. Once produced within the body, the antigen is recognized by the immune system and prepares it to fight the real thing. This type of vaccine is faster, safer and cheaper than conventional approaches, and can be standardized and made at scale. Sounds pretty good for a pandemic, doesn't it? And a bunch of the leading COVID contenders are using this method. But the genetic strands in the vaccine may elicit an unintended immune reaction, so they do need proper testing. And this type of vaccine also needs constant refrigeration, which is a bugger when it comes to servicing the whole world. Moderna and Pfizer are two of the leading vaccine teams using the mRNA approach against SARS-2. And what about recombinant vector vaccines? Well, they also use a strand of the genetic code from the pathogen, but also use an attenuated different virus as a ride for the DNA. So in essence, scientists can take a harmless bug. Uh, in the example of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, they take uh, a chimpanzee cold virus, uh, dress it in some dangerous DNA, uh, that of SARS-2, and then they can train the body to both recognize and fight it effectively. Pretty cool, huh? This has the benefits of production uh, similar to the DNA and RNA approaches, and Cancino and, as I mentioned, Oxford AstraZeneca are two of the leading teams using this approach. What are the most common misconceptions about a vaccine? Well, to answer this one, I asked Danny Altman, who, just like me, does love a metaphor. Almost every report I read, even in quite um, knowledgeable, informed outlets, um, can't seem to escape the language of um, the race to the finishing line and the vaccine race and the warp speed race as, as if it was one size fits all and you know any that crosses the finishing line will do us because they're all the same as each other and that's you know I'm, I'm not just being a kind of um purist intellectual snob that's a language that really does us damage if you um had your life savings to spend on a family home you know would you stick a pin in a list and say well that, that's called a family home and i may come up with um caravan or, um, or a mansion, and I don't really care because it's all a family home? Or would you do the most careful, you know, compare and contrast on the planet? Um, and the answer is, you know, hopefully the latter. So why not for a global response in terms of the vaccine? You know, there are so many different varieties out there, and they're all different, and the details really, really matter. I don't want the six-month slightly dangerous vaccine if I could have the six-year not dangerous vaccine. Why would I? So what are those details? What does a good vaccine look like? When I'm doing my um, you know, consumer analysis of the 169 possibilities and not just sticking a pin in the list, um, what, what am I going to be scoring for? So the thing that I want, it's, it's a very, very long wish list, which is, and I ideally hope that all of our political leaders 
um, and ministers of health in all the countries are scrutinizing this list you know, in the utmost detail because what they should be wanting is something that's um, easy and safe to produce at speed and at a good cost such that you can roll it out equitably to anybody in the world um, you know, in countries that are rich or poor um, equally and, and in good time. Um, you need to be able to not just produce it, you need to be able to transport it. So, um, so I suppose the point I, I've always made is that we talk very kind of glibly about um, rollout of the vaccine and will it be ready before Christmas or after Christmas. But um, the biggest vaccine initiatives we've ever had in the history of humankind have been in millions of doses. We're now talking about a vaccine initiative in billions of doses. So that's like in the blink of an eye having politicians saying, well, um, you know, we've been very good at organizing our cross-channel ferries. So now we're going to organize a mission to Mars. You know, there's a, there's a quantum leap there that nobody's thought about. You know, how is this really, really going to work? Who's going to do it? How are they going to give it? Where are they going to give it? How are they going to get it there? How are they going to monitor it when they're given it? Um, we've never thought on that scale. And I wish I could, could be confident that they're thinking on that scale at the moment. Maybe they are or maybe they're not. So, so we've got to how are you going to make it? How are you going to make it at cost? How are you going to transport it? Um, who's going to give it? If you look at the, the minutiae of the data on the, the sort of leading vaccines that are furthest ahead, they have very different data on whether you've given it you know, once, twice or three times. So if we've got to give it once, then we've got to get everybody on planet Earth into some clinic or car park or whatever it is, um, you know, once times seven billion attempts. If we've got to give it twice, that's tw twice that at what, a six week interval, um, you just, you know, you just doubled your, your Mars mission and made it twice as hard. Um, so, so those details really matter. Um, then um, have you got effective protective immunity? So most of the candidates that I've looked at in detail look to me like they would more or less do what it says on the tin. They would probably give you a reasonably high level of the kind of antibody you want, neutralizing antibody, and a reasonably high level of protective T cells to kill the virus that's got into any cells. Um, but then you worry about how much is enough and how, much would it, how long would it last for? Um, so again, why would I need, want to stick my pin in the list and pick one that's going to give me effective immunity for six months if I could have picked on 10 positions down on the list that'll give me immunity for six years. I've never heard any politician or minister of health or civil servant discuss this point, but it seems to me like a kind of life and death point. And for reference, the kind of T-cell response we'd be looking at would be around 10 times that we'd see in people who have recovered from an infection with the virus. So it's significant. Who are the leading contenders right now? Worldwide, there are about 160 different vaccines in development for COVID-19. Seven or eight of them, depending on how you look at it, are either in or about to start phase three trials. That is to say, they are the furthest ones along in the development process. Uh, in no particular order, they are these ones. And of course, you may have heard of Sputnik, the Russian vaccine, which was approved before it even started phase three trials. You can see that there's a number of different approaches taken by all the leading teams, each with their own pros and cons, which in the interest of keeping this film under an hour long, I won't go into. But as you can see, this is very much not a one size fits all landscape. If you want some more details in a concise form on these leading candidates, there's some great info on Dr. Eric Topol's thread here. I'll link in the description as usual. So what do we mean when we talk about these phase one, two and three trials? What actually happens in them? We need clinical trials to establish the efficacy and safety of any new drug being created. And that, of course, includes vaccines. Phase one trials typically test the vaccine against a placebo or control treatment uh, in a small sample of volunteers numbering perhaps 10 to 50. Phase one is primarily interested in testing the safety of the vaccine. Assuming there are no significant adverse events, phase two trials can begin. These target hundreds of people in the vaccine target population to test efficacy and dosing. I'll hand over to Danny for some more details. Phase two is what quite a lot of the candidates have done. That means you've got a variable number of volunteers, in the Russian case, 38. 
in the case of all the other candidates, many, many, many hundreds or thousands. And you've um, you've got your volunteers and you've screened them and you've tested them and you've injected either one, two or three doses of your candidate vaccine. And you've monitored everything possible you can monitor in those people in terms of um, immediate adverse events, immediate antibody responses, immediate cellular T cell responses. Um, and you've, you've really monitored them as hard as you can go. So that's your phase two trial. If the vaccine successfully gets through phase two, then phase three trials can begin. This stage would normally take 18 months or more and involve samples of five to 10,000 people. So you can see how much pressure the vaccine teams are under. And these sample sizes are often quite a lot bigger in the cases of the leading candidates here, numbering tens of thousands. Really a huge, huge process. This stage also moves the trial out of the lab and into the real world. So the phase three trial means that we took several thousand people in the heat of battle in a place where you can get infected with this thing. And we worked out, A, whether you can get statistically significant protection from getting the infection in, the, in a real life setting. Um, and B, whether when those people who were vaccinated meet the, the real life vaccine, in other words, a, 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 a real life virus, in other words, a virus challenge, does anything bad happen? So a lot of the bad things that we're most worried about, the adverse events, wouldn't be apparent in the phase two trial. They'd only be apparent when you meet the virus again. What are these adverse effects? Well, ADE or antibody dependent enhancements can potentiate viral entry into host cells and worsen disease. And Th2 lung pathology, which we'll come back to in a moment. What are the risks of rushing a vaccine? With both Russia and China approving vaccines before even starting phase three trials, and now the FDA wanting to rush vaccine approvals through, it's extremely important that we know what the risks are. I asked Danny if this news worried him. I'm not a very alarmist person, but I couldn't be more worried if I tried, yeah? So, um, you know, I grew up in what I perceived to be a sort of world order of how we do things, what our procedures are for things, and what our safeguards and our monitoring and our regulatory procedures are. And suddenly we hear that um, both Russia and China have pushed through vaccines um, with not terribly good supportive data at phase two. So the, the distinction here between the phase two thing and phase three really matters, yeah? Because um, the vast majority of all the vaccines that have ever been tested for production in the last several decades haven't come a cropper at that stage. They've nearly all come a cropper at the next stage, the so-called the phase three trial. So one of the things that people worry about a lot in coronavirus based on experiences with the SARS and MERS vaccine attempts is sure you want to induce strong cellular immunity, T cell immunity, but if you induce the wrong type, so for people like me, the wrong type here would mean what we call Th2 immunity. So Th2 immunity is the kind of thing that gives you asthma. So imagine if you're trying to get protective immunity in your lungs and you've induced the kind of cells that are gonna to whiz to your lungs and induce massive inflammation, that would be you know, global disaster for your, for your, for your vaccine initiative. Um, and meanwhile, you've already rolled out a billion doses, you know, that would so not be good news. Um, so you can see why when I hear that anybody, whether in Russia or China or anywhere else, is attempting to bypass all of the, the hurdles we've had in place for decades now and fast track and say, well, it doesn't really matter. We'll just zoom through to licensing and rolling this thing out. It really, really horrifies me. So... I've thought of the United States and the FDA as the absolute bastions of those requirements and standards and, you know, totally, um, you know, beyond reproach in terms of maintaining the highest um, kind of global exemplar of how one does this thing. So to see any, um, well, I don't know, any attempt at sort of political coercion or manipulation of that um, strikes fear into me. And the rest of us, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but yeah. The rest of us, we're prepared to actually give it some thought. And what about those waning antibodies? The widely reported fall off in antibody levels a short time after a SARS-2 infection has been widely reported. The question thrown out by the media is, if your natural antibodies don't last long, then how can a vaccine that is designed to trigger them 
actually last long enough to create any kind of a long-lasting immunity. But it's not quite that simple. Varying degrees of consensus about whether the antibodies do wane or not. I think at least a, a large part of the repertoire does wane quite fast in quite a lot of people. Would vaccines just reiterate that fragile transient immunity? And for me, the whole point of a well-designed vaccine rationale is that it doesn't do that. It says, let's take the stimulatory parts of this virus and drop them into some kind of cassette where we can bypass all those problems and make it really stimulatory, stimulatory to the immune system. And that's what nearly all of these approaches do, except for things like the Chinese approaches that are basically um, inactivated or attenuated viruses. Virtually all the other approaches have very clever ways of bypassing that problem. Um, so the, um, one of the ones that a lot of people like, the, um, the Oxford vaccine from the Jenner Institute, they've got a, a track record of some decades now of saying, let's take the most stimulatory parts of the virus and drop them into another innocuous virus um, in this case, a sort of common cold adenovirus. And then, again, many years ago, they came up with the confounder that lots of us have had common colds and have antibodies to it and therefore wipe out the vaccine as soon as you try and put it in. So they came up with a clever step to bypass even that and said, well, in that case, let's not hu use um, a human common cold virus. Let's use a chimpanzee common cold virus that none of us have ever seen. Um, and therefore, we won't have antibodies to it. And that's why their vaccine works way, way better than the kind of similar but different um, Russian and Chinese candidates. Um, so these, these are all ways of saying whatever quirks there are of the real life infection, we can bypass that and produce something that might give you rip roaring immunity for many, many years. So that at least is not something to worry about. Good news. How long can we expect a vaccine to last? So this isn't something we can really answer at the moment because the answers are going to be different between each of the leading contenders. Some may need boosters after six months or a year. Some may not. We simply don't have the data or the knowledge of which vaccines are going to be available where and when in order to answer those questions yet. It is unfortunately that old chestnut of it depends. In an optimistic, realistic, sensible world, when would you hope to see a vaccine? Yeah, it's a really hard to say, isn't it? So, yeah. so I would really love to imagine that the world will continue to follow protocols and have um, a rational approach to following all of the safety protocols because the price to pay for um, launching suboptimal or even dangerous vaccine programs would be too horrendous to imagine. Imagine not just in terms of, of repercussions for this infection, but for all other infections that we try and control with vaccines. You know, we could erode um, several hundred years of progress on vaccinology in one fell swoop if we're not careful. So if you say we're going to follow regulatory procedures to licensure, um, that depends on when is the moment reached when somebody has a data set in phase three saying, yep, you know, 5,000 people got the vaccine, 5,000 people got the placebo, and I did my stats tests, and the protection was, you know, whatever, you know, a 1,000 times better with, 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 with the vaccine. So, obviously, there are tests going on at the moment in places where there's quite a high rate of infection, where you'd be able to see an effect, places like um, USA and Brazil. Um, so, um, I could easily imagine that somebody will have that data set sometime early next year and if that happened you could imagine that um, batches of people might be getting rolled out vaccine what six months into 2021 that that's my kind of time scale so vaccine by the end of the year probably not one you'd want to take anyway what about viral mutation coronaviruses mutate rapidly in fact see my previous film on the subject what does this mean for a vaccine are we going to need a new one every year, like the flu shot? Barring, in fact, even the issues around how long the immunity lasts. Might it even be obsolete before the vaccine's even released? You know, there's been enormous work around the world to um, sequence virus in real time from the initial Wuhan outbreak onwards. And there are now um, hundreds of thousands of viral sequences out there. 
and you could eyeball that and say, well, that looks very scary because, um, because you know, it looks like a, a Jackson Pollock painting of all these different blotches of different breaks around the world that are different sequences. But compared to the, the language we speak in, say, influenza infection, where it's varying in such a kind of menacing way that last year's vaccine isn't relevant to this year's out- outbreak, that's simply not the case here. So it's, you know, it's many, many um, bits of nucleic acid with teeny variations but they don't seem to make a difference to um, to the bit the vaccine attacks. So not something we need to be worrying about at the moment. Some more good news. And as a late good news addition, see this piece of insight from Dr. Eric Topol. Slow genetic drift and well suited for a vaccine. Good stuff. Will it be safe? This is the big one, isn't it? with one in five Britons likely to refuse a vaccine, and that number rising to one in three in the United States, there's clearly a great deal of concern about the safety of any coronavirus vaccine. And it hit the news recently when the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine had to halt their phase three trial to investigate a case of transverse myelitis that occurred in one of the participants. But this is why phase three trials exist, to make sure this kind of event doesn't happen in the population at large. It's also worth pointing out that this kind of clinical hold on a trial is actually far from uncommon. It's just most trials don't have quite the spotlight on them that the current series of vaccines uh, against COVID-19 do. After review of the case in question, this trial is now underway again. So, at the end of the day, once a vaccine has gone through all of the requisite process and passed all of the clinical trials, it is fair to consider it safe. That's what those millions of dollars and pounds and hours of work that goes into phase one, two and three establish. Might there be side effects? Might you feel crappy for a couple of days after taking the vaccine? Yes. Is Bill Gates trying to put a microchip in your brain? No. Now, there is a question here, and that is, will everywhere in the world get access to a vaccine that has gone through all of the requisite trials to establish safety? As we've already seen in Russia and China, The answer to that question is unfortunately probably no. So the important information here is really that not all vaccines are created equal. Pay attention to the details because the details are important. If it's legit, should you take it? I put this question to Danny as I felt that he could answer it better than I could. People who come from my professional background have kind of shied away from some kind of big full-on battle with anti-vaxxers, um, partly because um, you know, life's too short and we've all got other things to do and it's, it's not a debating society. But all I would say that is, in this instance, anybody can see self-evident in front of you the impact this has had on planet Earth, on deaths, on illness, on the economy, on our jobs, on our schooling, on our ambitions, on our everyday life. We don't know of any escape route from what we're going out, going through at the moment, um, except to get to the point where 60% plus of the population have full-blown protective, effective immunity. Um, there's no evidence that natural infection can achieve that, except at the cost of many, many more millions dead than we have at the moment. So the only viable option we have is an effective vaccine, So again, without wanting to kind of take anybody on in a fight, all I would say is whatever theories you've read on social media, um, this is a time to put those to one side. And even if you don't feel vulnerable or you don't mind getting the infection, um, you're in a network of people with your older relatives and your older colleagues and your vulnerable colleagues and people with vulnerabilities you might not even have registered so you don't know people's health conditions and immune status and um, every single person who doesn't get the vaccine puts those people at enormous risk and if we have a sub set of society that don't want the vaccine and we dip below that 60 percent level and we can't ever be rid of this thing so all i would say is you know we're all in this together more than at any other point in my lifetime all of us around the world are in this together i couldn't agree more There's quite a lot to get your head around on this topic. In summary, uh, I would just say two things if you want to try and come at the subject with some balance. 
Firstly, stay away from conspiracy theories on social media, or anywhere else for that matter. That is, unless you prefer to make your decisions based on no evidence, as opposed to reams and reams of peer-reviewed clinical evidence, which is my personal preference. And the second is, pay attention to the detail, and let's hope together that our policymakers don't let politics get in the way of public health. It's frustrating for me to hear policymakers talk about vaccines like it would be frustrating for a car enthusiast to, to, to hear somebody talking about a car. You know, well, you know, I don't know, it's a Mini Metro and Aston Martin, they're all, all the same thing, aren't they? And the answer is, no, they're really not. No, they're really not. As much as I love a Metro, I'll take the Aston Martin. But DB6 or V8? A question perhaps for another film. In fact, just like this one, what about the flu shot? Should you take it, this year in particular? How, how's that going to interact with a SARS-2 vaccine? Big subject, and I'll try and address that in my next film. By the way, quickly before I wrap up, I'd just like to make a quick apology for taking quite so long to get this film out. As you may have noticed from the crutches in the background, I have recently contrived to break my pelvis, uh, along with still struggling to manage long COVID. So it's not been the best year so far when it comes to personal mobility. But hey, there's still time, and at least <laughs> the pelvis is going to heal. Who knows about long COVID? Uh, look after yourselves, and uh, till next time. <laughs> <laughs>